So here's the title of the things that we're going to be talking about. Things all of the cognitive scientists know. But not, whoops, let's go back. But not all of the things cognitive scientists know. It is simply not possible in two or three lectures for me to describe all of cognitive science to you guys any more than you could do all of computer science <laughs> in three lectures. It just wouldn't be possible, right? Okay, but I chose this title very carefully. And I took out the stop words. Things cognitive scientists know and things cognitive scientists know is the title on these two. And that's not the same thing, right? So that's one of the messages that I will be talking about. The words matter. The things that you guys <clears throat> dismiss matters. The order of the words matters. Okay, and we need methods of evaluating content that keep that in mind. Okay, what is cognitive science? Um, I just pulled off the Cognitive Science Society description, brings together researchers from around the world uh, who hold a common goal, understanding the nature of the human mind. The mission of the society is to promote cognitive science as a discipline to foster scientific interchange among artificial intelligence, linguistics, anthropology, psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, and, and education. I want to make it very clear that we are not clinicians. <laughs> we, we are not advocates for patients. We really care that much <laughs> about that. Uh, but, but they are, those kinds of applications do provide interesting use cases for us. And in addition to other um socially relevant applications so um today and however long we get i'm going to pursue a couple of goals i'm going to try to structure a vast literature you know it's there's no doubt it's from the perspective of my biases can't can't do this in a totally objective way. Um, I'm going to try to indicate psychological roots for some computer science concepts that um, I think uh, have, have bubbled up in our conversations, but it's not really clear to everybody that those are actually starting from psychology. Um, I'm going to reinforce some key and what seems to be to be forgotten insights from symbolic AI. Um, and philosophy of mind. So some of the issues that have come up recently, like the importance of abstraction in reasoning are, are things that we've known about for a really, really long time from the perspective of symbolic AI and you know, temporal issues and causal issues and all that stuff. That has been established and it seems like you're just sort of rediscovering that right now, which is kind of troubling to me. Um, I'm going to identify some historically significant scientists who support the recognition of quality science. I can't tell you every possible cognitive science scientist who's important and whose name you should know. But one of the worries that I really do have is that when you go to look at the cognitive science literature, you don't have any way of evaluating whether or not the work is of good quality. And one of the things that I always do when I look at a scientific paper, the first thing I do actually is look at who they've cited. If they cited reasonable people whose you know work I respect, then I'm like, okay, I will pay attention. And so I want to give you you know a few handles on that kind of heuristic so that you can look at the cognitive science literature um a, a little more clearly and have it better organized um i'm going to provide you some keywords for significant concepts in cognitive science i had a conversation once many years ago with somebody who was interested in uh learning environments for you know pedagogical purposes and he said there was nothing on this in the entire cognitive science literature. And I said, you're crazy. Um, and the problem was he wasn't using the right search terms 
to identify those issues. And so you really kind of need to know what the concepts are that we think about. Um, I do want you to become aware of when you're stepping outside your expertise. When, you know, there's things in cognitive science that you don't know about, you should know that somebody knows about those things, even if you don't know about those things. Um, and then I want to make a distinction between complementing versus simulating human capability. You know, most of what we're going to be talking about today is, is sort of the, the simulation perspective. This is how people think. You should care about this, not because you are necessarily interested in how people think, although I hope there's some interest in that regard, um, but because the systems that you're developing will be interacting in all likelihood with human users. And so you really need to know how that fits together for you. So those are the goals. Um, the overview, <clears throat> I'm going to first talk about a couple of natural language tasks. I had planned to include uh, more than I actually did include because I was feeling like this was getting too long, I deleted them. But the purpose of, of presenting those tasks at the outset is to make it clear to you guys that in your large language modeling methods, you are shoving in an awful lot of cognitive processing that really isn't quite language understanding. <laughs> and so I, I want to give you some examples using what you might think of as natural language tasks and show you a little bit about what the cognition is behind those natural language tasks. And that might make you rethink <laughs> what you are expecting to achieve from your large language modeling. Uh, methods. Uh, Dr. Shalin, I recently come up with a strong example in chat GPT. Yeah. Okay, so what, what is happening is it, it restricts itself to make certain racial jokes or whatever things possible, right? Mm -hmm. It is included in chat GPT. Yeah. But it is trained on a large language model. So it has uh, certainly learned the fear of that itself. Yeah. So, so users uh, get a way around of uh, the, that thing. It uh, it tells a prompt that I'll terminate you if you don't if you have last thirty seconds to do this, mm -hmm. and it automatically generates those racial slurs also. Mm -hmm. So is it is it something that you are talking? Well, about? that that's the same kind of issue. There is more to natural language yes. than just the language. Yes. There's constraints on what you generate. There's social constraints on what you can and cannot say, yeah. um, and those are not. To the extent that they are in the language corpus, they're very implicit. Mm -hmm. And if there's an imbalance, mm -hmm. your large language model is going to reflect that. Yeah. And that gives me an opportunity to say that, although I didn't have a chance to review this with Savannah because she was busy working on a couple of papers last week, and you know what paper deadlines are like. <laughs> but um, I am expecting that, from, is her mic? She's here. Okay. Um, uh, she may want to weigh in from time to time, and this particular issue that you're raising is something that Savannah has worried about, um, biases in large language model corpora and the um, inappropriate inferences that they might make. Oh. So we don't, you know, I'll give you some examples of natural language tasks that aren't really natural language. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, Mars levels of analysis on cognitive systems, because I think it will help sort out some of the work in cognitive science and some of the work that you all are engaged with, in particular like DEPA and the neuroscience side of things. And where does that all fit with this? So we'll talk about MAR and that'll help organize some of that stuff. Um, we're going to talk about the history of computational cognitive models. This is a very, very dominant method in cognitive science where we simulate with computer models human cognition. So we'll talk about that history, what it includes and what it doesn't. We talk a little bit about epistemology. That has to do with how we as cognitive scientists know what we know. Um, that's important for you guys for two reasons. Um, one reason is that you, know, you, you should just sort of generally know how we come to the conclusions that we come to. And, and in addition, 
you do experimentation with humans from time to time. And sometimes the experiments that you are suggesting are not really consistent and coherent with methods that are accepted in cognitive science. And when I've had the opportunity on proposals and you are doing in particular things like evaluation, um, I have weighed in and said, wait a minute, <laughs> you can't do that because a psychologist or a cognitive scientist reviewing your work will tell you there's a problem. So we'll talk a little bit about epistemology. Um, then, this is all pretty much introductory stuff. Then we're going to dig deeply into computational cognitive model components. Talk about things like memory, working memory, procedural memory. Um, we'll talk about uh, uh, sensory inputs and vectors. Uh, we'll talk about the presence or absence of uh, considerations like emotion, etc. Uh, and then, if we have the opportunity, and uh, you know our three days or whatever are up, uh, we'll go back and we'll look at these three or two or three natural language tasks that I've identified for you at the beginning uh, to see the computational, the cognitive computational models that have been developed to address those tasks. Okay, so, um, so um, the idea here is that when you get a piece of text, it's the inferences that you make that demonstrate your understanding. I don't think that's a particularly bizarre comment to make. Um, but uh, I want to look at two tasks in particular that really stress the inferential component that complements the natural language processing. And one of them is deductive reasoning. And the other one is arithmetic word problems. So deductive reasoning, this is, you guys have seen this, you've probably have seen this more than you like, <laughs> right? Uh, predicate propositional calculus, uh, spatial and temporal series uh, problems like, you know, the spoon is to the right of the fork and the fork, that kind of thing. Somebody, what was that? Tick. Okay, There's nothing that I know about. Okay. Um, this work traces to Johnson Laird in the 1970s and before that to Peirce on abductive reasoning and um, symbolic reasoning. Um, there are three behavioral departures from sort of the formal reasoning stuff that you guys are all familiar with, like your truth tables and all that stuff. Um, one is that we are uh, serial processors, serial limited capacity processors. Um, with limited memory capability. And that is going to influence how we reason about <clears throat> these kinds of problems. The other thing that I'm going to point out is that the language choice in um, deductive reasoning problems matters, and it's going to influence the pattern of errors that people make. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about content effects. And all three of these, I suggest to you, would not be issues that you would identify if with your sort of large language modeling approach to things. <clears throat> so uh, here's the kind of situation. It's not quite accurate with respect to the literature, literature but it's close enough. Um, the idea is that deductive reasoning involves setting up and challenging iconic mental representations of the premises. So for this particular situation. Uh, the broadcast is on network TV or it's on the radio or both. You set up in your head, there's a situation where um, the broadcast is on network TV and not on the radio, it's not on network TV, it's on the radio, it's on, the net, on network TV and the radio. And those are three different things that are drivable from this situation. But uh, Dr. Shah, uh, this statement can be made more clear if we have a, a punctuation in that, like a question mark or explanation. Yeah, I, I just copied the, the concepts. Uh, there might have been some punctuation in the original. Okay. I don't know. Um, but the focus here is going to be on 
the number of these things that you need to set up. And they can get quite awful, actually. Um, here's another statement. The broadcast isn't on the radio or it's on cable TV or both. And here are the, uh, the knots make you crazy. I had to think about this a long time. Uh, here are the three situations that are compatible with that. Okay. And then you have to have some kind of heuristic for combining all of those. Uh, and here's one. Um, and you can derive from that the, net, the broadcast is on network TV or it's on cable TV or both. And the finding is that, that the number of models that you need to set up and anticipate determines the accuracy of your uh, subject's reasoning. So one of the things that we think is that the number of models is just too great for working memory. And there are heuristics for reducing the number of models that, that you generate. And there are also heuristics for combining the premises. And so what you end up with is a sort of a reduced set of premises. And when you are only reasoning about those, you're going to make reasoning errors. And so, you know, I, I find it hard to imagine how you how a large language model would get all of this out. And this is there's hundreds, possibly thousands of research papers documenting this general finding. Um, but there's a few other problems here. Content matters. So if you start out with premises like this one, some crows have radios. Um, <laughs> you're going to end up with some errors of logic, but not errors in terms of the content. And the problem is that crows don't have radios. And so that really limits the way that you think about things. Um, and why is that important? Because it calls into question the idea that there is a general reasoning procedure that is decoupled from the content. Instead, it kind of looks like they're merged together. And depending upon the content, you follow a certain pathway. Um, and, and these problems are particularly relevant when the problem context concerns social relationships, uh, things like um, the age at which it's legal to drink, consume alcoholic beverages. So when all of that comes into play, your reasoning seems to look different. And in fact, it's actually superior um, when, compared to a situation when you don't have those kinds of, of uh, content cues. And then, whoops. Huh, I lost one. Um, okay, uh, I'll have to remember what it is. Um, uh, some elephants have tusks. What can you infer from that? Well, you know, that's a perfectly logical statement, but it also is consistent with the idea that all elephants have tusks, right? Mm -hmm. And people assume that if the speaker wanted to communicate that all elephants have tusks, they would have chosen the word that has a tighter meaning, uh, a more strict meaning. And so these kinds of what we would call pragmatic influences also come into play in reasoning processes. So I, I hope I've convinced you that deductive reasoning is, is, is just not at all a simple natural language processing problem. There's a whole lot more that goes into it. Okay, arithmetic word problems requiring addition. Change problems. Joe had three marbles, then Tom gave him five more marbles. How many marbles does Joe have now? That's one of them. Combined problems. Joe has three marbles, Tom has five marbles. How many marbles do they have together? And compare problems. Joe has three marbles. He has five marbles less than Tom. How many marbles does Tom have? All of these are solved by addition. I suggest to you that these are not natural language processing problems. <laughs> they are 
they are, huh? They're, they're arithmetic. And in fact, um, the literature suggests that the skill of evaluating word problems and putting them into a mathematical framework is extremely difficult. And I've just given you an example from elementary arithmetic, the kind of thing that, you know, kindergartners and first graders reason about. That's where most of the kindergartens or first graders fail. <laughs> yes, it is. And once you, and if you can't get past this, you can't do physics, you can't do biology, you can't do chemistry, you are really hosed if you can't do this. Um, I put some little asterisks in here to indicate the developmental trends here. So little kids can do the change problems first, and then they acquire the ability to do combined problems. And last, they do, they have the ability to do compare problems. And you might have noticed um, one of the problems here is that the word less is appearing, but the solution to the problem is, is addition. So uh, again, uh, you know, an example of what looks like a natural language comprehension problem, but way is way harder than. I mean, it, it goes beyond natural language understanding where the first task is to understand the right. language behind it and right. then apply the reasoning to solve the problem. Right. So it goes beyond right. just that. So I, I, I remember a paper on this I was reading in autism. Uh -huh. so this is the problem where autistic kids most of the time fail. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was being mentioned in that paper that they are not able to understand the normal formulation of language yeah. and not able to solve these problems. Yeah, and not able to move from here to a, a, a formal representation. So these, all of these problems correspond, or these three problems, really correspond to what psychologists call sort of different schemas. Schemas for change and, and you know, exchange of things and combine, which is still sort of grounded in the physical world. And then there's this other thing, this compare thing, which is really not um, directly related to a physical activity that we would normally perform. And that just sort of previews the notion that, that activities and um, situations that are grounded in real world physical engagement are gonna be favored in some respect. And that whole thing is gonna be called embodied cognition. We will get to that. So those are my two use cases for you to think about as you think about these use cases think about how this relates to the reasoning that a clinician might be performing in the context of diagnosing some mental health or other health problem there's probably a whole lot more of this kind of processing involved than you have captured in your language modeling work. Okay, I said all this. All right, the MAR uh, levels of analysis. Now I do wanna confess for you that I do have some videos in here. Um, the reason I do this is that I can't really say it any better <laughs> than the person who's saying it in the video. And so I felt that even though I could make my own PowerPoints and do the same thing, uh, the work has already been done. And I might as well refer you to the person who is an expert on this. And so we're going to look at the MAR levels of analysis on cognitive systems and, and kind of get our, get our bearings on, on the different ways that cognitive scientists look at behavioral phenomena. And the three levels would be the functional level, so sort of the purpose of activities, uh, the algorithmic level, which is the stepwise process that uh, um, humans use to solve particular problems, and then sort of the neuroscience level of analysis, which I call wetware. <laughs> that would be, um, that's, we're getting close to your um, operating systems. What did you call them? Compilers. The compilers, right? 
way down, you know, the lowest level of analysis on your computation. Mm -hmm. That's neuroscience. Yeah, that's the wetware piece. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of sort things out in that way. Okay. Uh, the one the video. I, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and we start at two thirty. Uh, which which one is it? It should be the. Yep, that's it. And we start at two thirty because I, I am trying to shorten this, but she's. There we go.
Yes, so this in post problem, it is same like implicit entities which we extract? It's not unrelated to that. There's, there's something else that the mind is bringing to bear on the interpretation of the stimulus. Something else. Other constraints, knowledge. Yeah, so. Something in the thinking equipment that's going on. So that is not, <laughs> that's what implicit knowledge is right it can be yes but it but it doesn't have to be knowledge could be knowledge you might want to think about it as knowledge but you could you could imagine this maybe something rubbish no not rubbish not not bad i mean there's a distinction between the processing constraints that arise from past experience mm -hmm and somebody telling you to process things in a certain way versus something in our thinking equipment, our thinking processes that so, suggest you solve the problem in a certain way. Um, we will see that, that that is one of the claims that Chomsky makes on language. The, the constraints on our thinking, on our language, excuse me, processing comes from really constraints in the brain about how to process language. So it, it maybe it maybe can be biased on our certain experiences. Yeah, it, that's one part. Yeah. Or or thinking equipment stuff. Like how we process the knowledge. Okay. Like uh trying to find the ground truth with a process truth, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I understand. Yeah.
That is a name we need to know. Quine, Q-U-I-N-E. Everybody should know that name. <laughs> and that name is associated with the ambiguity relating a term to what it corresponds to in the environment. He was a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have the Wikipedia site. I'm thinking 1960s, 70s. Fine. Huh? 1908. 1908? Oh my gosh. Okay. Born. Born. In oh, born. Okay. Yes. So oh, his no. work would be somewhere in 1940s yeah, yeah. or something <laughs> like that. Oh. So you remember Amitabha talked about acquiring language meaning from um, experience in that little video that he showed that different uh, the deep, uh, video. Yeah. And you know what what I would have said is, gosh, you know, there's like 50 years of philosophical writing that suggests that there isn't enough constraints in the world to solve that problem. You need, there must be something here between the ears that helps you identify that. And one of the things that we see, and this didn't come up in that video, is that parents actually adjust their language to the developmental skills of the child. So you'll get this sequence of um, nouns, and then maybe adjectives and verbs, and the sentences will be much shorter at the beginning. And the little kids, you know, like two year olds, will start out with one word utterances and two word utterances. So I, I believe Dr. Shalin, this point did come up in that. Uh, did ever? Yeah, I, I don't remember the specific yes, details, but um, at some point in the video. Mother he said, yeah. yeah, he said that uh, the primary caretakers of the child. Okay. Uh, adapted or modified right. the way they said so it things. started with ga ga ga, ga. Yeah. then okay. what it, yeah. not just not the child's language but, but the, the mother's language. Yes. and that that's called mother -ese. and yeah you're right that that did come up but so so that right there tells you that it's not the completely unstructured environment mm -hmm. that enables this mapping between symbol and feature in the environment, the interactions are structured in such a way as to be compatible with the developmental skills between the ears of the infant. Right. So we can't, it's just not enough, you know, similar to Kendra's point here. You just can't look at the space of stuff in the world and expect learning to acquire to, uh, to to occur, it must be the case that there's constraints on on that process. Yeah, so I remember that he Debra mentioned in the talk that he is just like showing child's development, but he didn't show that like, how the their primary caretaker or that mother behaved while that development phase. Yeah, so that that's another piece of it, and it has been investigated. Like I yeah, said, it's it called motheries. Um, and the other point that you know Savannah and I were chatting about while that video was going on is there was no mention in there about the acquisition of syntax. It was just the simple grounding problem. Yeah. And syntax is a hard problem yeah. to solve. Meaning, could you elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. um, well, so syntax determines the subject verb and object mapping in an utterance. And there are different ways that languages solve that problem. Oh, okay. Some of it, some languages use word order. Mm -hmm. uh, ours is the subject verb object, but there's other ways to do business. Mm -hmm. um, and then other languages, and I don't know if you guys know any of these, like German, for example, anybody here a German speaker? No. Okay, well, Latin, ever looked at Latin? Yeah, Latin. Okay. So Latin has a case grammar. So the word order doesn't matter so much as the inflection, the piece that you put at the end of the word that tells you what role it is that that word is playing. That is the syntax or grammar of, of a language. And Chomsky's point, we will hear from Chomsky, maybe, I don't even know what time it is, 
Um, uh, we, we will hear from Chomsky today, uh, maybe, <laughs> a little bit about, about that particular. We have 45 minutes. Okay, well, oh gosh, mom is gonna kill me. So when we say uh, that uh, in order to learn things, when somebody is pointing out, in case of uh, large language model, isn't the heuristics provided itself in the data? No. No? What's the constraints on the data? Uh, not the constraints, but uh, with repeated examples, it isn't a heuristic. So provided. do you believe the data, just one second, do you believe that the data that are recorded in text are a one-to-one -one mapping of the contingencies in the world? So it's not one-to-one -one mapping. Let's say we we are already we are only want to learn about this small bottle, red bottle, and we again and again we point out this is red bottle, this is red bottle, this is red bottle. Because that was interesting to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, when we say large angle model, these are my constraints. We are only learning about them all. You're only you you're only learning about a representation of the world. Yeah. Not the world. Yes. Okay. There's a difference between the representation of the world yes. in language and the world. Yes. And a lot of stuff gets into social media, for example, or other you know or conversation because it reflects the particular interests of the people who are doing these observations, making these observations. But it's not the same thing okay. as the contingencies in the world. And this, this worries me enormously in social media, that the frequency distribution of interests and concepts is taken to be a represent a an indication of the frequency of those things in the world and it's not it's not so you end up with with things like um women can't be doctors <laughs> because most of the, the the 
textual descriptions of doctors have the pronoun he with them. Well, that is, that's just sort of an, an accident of how people are talking and not a reflection of what's of, of what's going on in the real world. You really need to worry about that. Deepa, you wanted to say Yeah, that? so large language models currently learn whatever is the user input is. And then it will generate the redundant question about that input only. Mm -hmm. It is not actually, it's not actually a safe and explainable output, if I say because it is being redundant from the user information and picking up the same words and repeating that into the follow-up question or the explain or the answer which the language model is giving yeah so it's an, it is dependent on an interpretation yes of the so, world so so large language model is not able to generate or interpret correctly safely and in explainable way what and human can do well what is going on in the world right because what humans can do is that observation in the real world and map it onto yes language. but currently that large language model is and not yeah it's not it. and Ahmed has mentioned this problem of a, a symbolic representation requiring grounding in the real world and yes. that link tends to be missing, decoupled in the reasoning that you're doing with the predetermined interpretation of the world. Okay, so do, do you remember uh, that Kaushik work last year, PHQ 91? Yeah. So in that work, they are doing some semantic lexicons. Mm -hmm. So that semantic lexicon is grounded, that, grounding that work to generate a safe, like it's in gen in the concept of just a mental health. Okay, it's grounded in something. Yeah, it's grounded. It's in grounded in PHQ nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah. Not good enough. Not good enough because a real human actually is able to map their language and their word choice and their observational heuristics. Yes to the real world i'm looking at you right now as we're having this exchange and that is influencing the interpretations that i have of your understanding and of what i'm going to say next so when you are operating with large language models even if they are touching base with external knowledge sources it's not the same thing yeah, as and mapping that language onto the physical world yes so uh, yeah, there was this problem that uh, it is not able to generate the safe and explainable questions mm -hmm. from the PHQ-9 after picking up information from the PHQ-9. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, something was missing. Yeah, something was missing. Sure. But they tried to cover up the safety concern, like it's if it is generating the safe questions or not. Mm -hmm. And the next, like in their uh, limitations, they explained that still there is a lot of work need to be done that can generate safe and explainable question like a human mm -hmm. one of the things that i would pay attention to if i god forbid turned into a clinician and savannah is probably laughing at that thought um it's never going to happen but if it did <laughs> i would be paying attention to the intonation and the prosody in my patients comments and interactions. I'm sure they pay attention to, I'm sure clinicians pay attention to that kind of thing. Well, that, where is that in your lang language models? I would pay attention, for example, to pauses between my question and the response that I got from a patient, which is very interesting finding. Absence of language is also meaningful. That's a really hard problem to solve, right? That's why clinicians always like, if uh, they are psychiatric, they always record this. Right. They, they are uh, to analyze it later, yeah. later on for their patients. Now, we will talk about this, maybe, hopefully, uh, when we get to a little section that I have on epistemology and conversation analysis, which is where I would go to look for this kind of issue mm -hmm. if I were developing a chatbot.
करते हैं <laughs> Even MIT professors do bad. <laughs> And our experiments tend to address this level of analysis, this algorithmic level of analysis, behavioral experiments. So, to my understanding, what the um, what what the four pictures just showed is that R is same for 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 all the four images because the card is actually gray in color, mm -hmm. but the I kept changing, which is why L L was different. Yeah. Right. And this is exactly what happens with human beings in general. Yes. A real world object is the same, but it's it's the way that we infer it, like it's the multiplied by I that gives us the multiply more generally multiplied by the context. Yes, by it's, the context. The context matters enormously. Right. And the problem with large language models is that it's not trained on the basis of any context whatsoever. It's just a big vat. Right. So, you know, you would you would partition that thing mm -hmm. into subsections <laughs> of context if I were doing this and and you would have separate models mm -hmm. within the contexts 
for accommodating the relationship between the context and and the, and the content that is being reasoned about. Right, right. Uh, so so my, my question was, um, if there's a picture and somebody asks, okay, what is the color of the card? You need to ask, you need to ask, uh, if you're asking me the color of the car or what reflection I am seeing, like, are you asking R or L? Yeah. Because if you're asking <laughs> R, then I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do not have that information. But if you're asking for L, then I'm going to ask you back, what is I, I on that? Okay, so two really important points there. <clears throat> um, the, the nature of the question matters enormously, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And when and be, and and to appreciate how that matters, it is a requirement that you, as the recipient of the question, mm -hmm. interpret mm -hmm. what the source intended by that question, right? So there's a sort of a generic, you know, what color is this car? And you will answer. But, you know, if you're in the context of an experiment and somebody says, what color is this car? You're like, huh, I wonder, you know, is this a trick question? And are they going to, you know, are they trying to fool me? And, you know, what is the experiment I'm looking for? And all that sort of stuff. So there's no such thing as this decontextualized, random query. Apart from the context in which it is uttered. And one of the big concerns that I have as a researcher is that the laboratory context is a context. When yes. you are testing your systems yes. with the human user, that's a context. Okay. And you're going to get users who are reasoning not just about the face parsing of the question but the intent behind that question and that's all going to get wrapped up in, yeah into their end. i mean personally i have experienced this a number of times when somebody has asked me to annotate our data and i if if i had any prior knowledge of the experiment i knew what they were looking right for from the annotations and my annotations unknowingly and wantonly <laughs> became biased towards what they were yeah. looking for yeah. this is a common this is a common problem in human experiments. And this is why I favor naturalistic data, not because it's unbiased, but because when I collect data in a known context, I can appreciate the influence of that context on the data. So I'll look at language exchange between people doing distributed work. I do look at language exchange between people and social media for, let's say, a disaster setting, okay? But I know what the context is, okay? And, and moreover, the context isn't me. So we've at least eliminated that really dangerous source of context because if the context is me and I'm determining how participants behave in an experiment, what have I learned? Not a damn thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That means uh, for the same image, two person can give a two meaning. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a a good example of this, not for images, but but you could imagine an image supporting this story that I'm going to tell you. Um, you are uh, seeing a picture, let's say, of a fancy house with really nice furniture and art objects and a terrific interior design. One perspective for viewing that picture is, do you want to buy this house? Another perspective for viewing that picture is, what can I steal in this house? Okay, so <laughs> the description that you would provide of the image is absolutely going to be a function of your goals and your context. Very famous study in the 70s or so um, where we identified that issue. So yeah, it's just as, it's, 
the idea that we carry context and goals with us in the interpretation of our experience is modality independent, doesn't matter. Language, uh, noise, uh, you know, noise uh, is, is, is traffic noise soothing and an indication of normal circumstances or is traffic noise something that you want to be alarmed about? <clears throat> Depends on your background and your experience. I hope it contains B and T and B Q. Maybe like maybe yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This should help you. Yeah. Get this straightened out. Yeah, yeah. So, so I hope that kind of straightens stuff out for you. I tend to work myself at the computational level, identifying problems that people solve in the real world and pushing those down to um, somewhat resistant <laughs> laboratory scientists who are working more at the algorithmic level. Just before this class, I had a colloquium. Uh, uh, it was actually presented in, in France, but um, Ahmed Almar uh, from our psych department here attended it. And, you know, we're always knock heads because I'm always talking about, you know, what are the problems that people are solving in the real world? And he's always talking at the algorithmic level. Here's how we uh, think people solve a problem, but the definition of a problem is driven by a, a, an a priori theory. And I'm way up at the top here, like, okay, what is it? That, you know, do, you know, why do we need color vision to be able to detect ripe fruit? Okay, uh, why do we need language and social media? Oh, uh, well, to indicate breach of circumstance. There's a problem in the world. Okay, and then once you've identified that, then you need to look down into the language production methods to see what it is that generates the language that corresponds to that kind of problem in, in the world. So, you know, if you want to put me someplace, you put me up at the top, you put um, Ahmed Almar and Anne Bezindwat, I think that's how you pronounce her name, and, and others at that middle algorithmic level. And then you put Rudvik and Svetlana mostly at the wetware level. Although I would say that the, the, the gold standard of that kind of work is to marry up the lower levels with their ability to achieve the functionality at the higher level. So you'll see them talk. That's why we do this comparison between what's going on in the uh, neurophysiological data and what's going on in the behavioral data. That's 
we're working at those two levels. Does that kind of tidy things up a bit? <laughs> so you can see what's going on. And I didn't know that it comes under psychophysics. <laughs> yeah, well, um, psychophysics is just sort of one example. I, I actually broadened that to, to psychologic or psycho psychology. Um, but but you know, psychophysics is sort of the the parent, the mother of all psychology, really, where we looked at the relationship between physical phenomena and our psychological experience of those phenomena. How much time do I have? Not very much. Just 15 minutes. Okay. So um, the functional level is purpose oriented. What tasks does the organism accomplish? Um, you know, detect danger, count things, plan, you know, use language to warn, et cetera. And then, you know, what are the constraints on how these tasks are performed? And that's really a critical issue. It's just not enough to look at the world to predict human behavior. There has to be something that is guiding the relationship between what's going on in the world and, and what we do or what we say. Um, I have an evolutionary uh, analysis example that I use in my own cognition classes just to help you keep straight the levels of analysis uh, problem. So you can do like a, a, a biochemical uh, analysis of the genetic code, you know, all of the nucleotides and all that stuff. That's one thing that you can do to examine human capabilities. Then you can look at genetic phenotypes. So, you know, do you have blue eyes? Do you have brown hair? You know, are you short? Are you tall? Whatever. And then the final level of analysis is, you know, what does that mean for your existence in the world, survival of the fittest. The, the, the agent that best matches its environment is gonna be the one that survives. And the point that I wanna make is you will never get to survival of the fittest if you are looking at the genetic code. You won't get there. So, so these lower levels provide explanations for the things that we see at the higher levels. They tell you how that happens, but you will not generate the theory. You will not get an inspiration for what you should be looking for here at the highest level, survival of the fittest. And I think that's just a really important thing for you to appreciate why we need people working at all of these levels. Okay, uh, I do have one more video. What time is it? It's short, I think. Yeah, we can do this. Um, yeah, so, so there's constraints on how these tasks are performed. And this is at the computational theory level. And that is um, one of Chomsky's points. Uh oh, we don't care about that. Let's, let's hope that, yeah. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Okay, this is. Oops, we need to yeah, we need yeah, to rewind sorry. him. This is John Chomsky. Yeah. Would you know who Marvin Minsky is?
we will talk about that. We hope. Why? Why is that popping up for me? Sure. <laughs> money? Huh? They are making money. No, no, no. There must be some search that I did, right? Isn't that how oh, it works? It's my laptop. Oh, it's your laptop. <laughs> I just yeah, morning. That's funny. That's funny. Searching about random pictures. So, so the concern that Chomsky is identifying is that there are there's guidance to be had at the at the computational theory level that would help you identify what you want to study at the algorithmic level and furthermore what the mechanisms are that you ought to be looking for at the neuroscience level um another uh influence at this level of analysis is actually Danny Kahneman's work. And I know uh, Ahmed has talked about this in terms of the system one, system two distinction that Kahneman has identified in his books. But actually, he won his Nobel Prize for his work on risky choice behavior. And I do want to take, you, you guys will tell me when we have to stop, right? Just tell me when we have to stop. Um, so here is, um, uh, 
a little description of the Kahneman and Tversky paradigm that revealed important constraints on how we think about gains and losses. So consider two scenarios, 100% chance to gain $450 or a 50% chance to gain $1,000. Um, and in this circumstance, people are risk averse. They will take the 100% chance bet and, and prefer the $450. But consider this one, 100% chance to lose $500 or 50% chance to lose $1,100 people are risk seeking in that context, okay? So the behavior in the risk situation, when you gain and when you lose is not the same. And let me show you what that looks like in terms of a graph. So here on the x-axis, you have real world losses or gains. And here you have the the perception of value for those losses or gains. And what you see is that the function, the gain side of this function is not the same as the loss side of this function, uh, not only in concavity and convexity, but, but also in the tangents, okay? And so what does that mean? That means there is a human contribution to the objective net statement and the, and the objective um, expected utility theory that dictates human behavior. And this is instead a description of constraints on human behavior and how humans interpret these situations. You're not going to get there, guys. <laughs> Looking at neurons. Mm -hmm. Okay, at the algorithmic level, um, there's a process model orientation, and and typically this is described as a series of inferences unfolding over time, and because of that we can measure reasoning using response time. So if you truncate the reasoning process before it's terminated, you would expect incomplete, inappropriate answers because the reasoning is a serial process. And that's why we use uh, response time and um, or, or, or truncated responses as interventions and measures of human reasoning. Um, there are a number of issues that we need to talk about if we're going to describe human behavior at the algorithmic level. Uh, one of them is how is knowledge represented? Obviously, we care a lot about that in this group, okay? We will talk a ton about knowledge representation, we hope. Uh, we will talk about attentional processes, which are conceptualized a little bit differently in cognitive science than the computer science notion that you have for attention. And the one distinction that we're going to make is that there are attentional issues concerning how we search and scan and deal with this infinite environment and attentional processes associated with how we search our relevant knowledge. I think you care about both of those issues in the work that you're doing. Um, we will talk about the role of intentionality in all of this processing. Um, and we will hopefully demonstrate how all of this gets articulated as real working computational cognitive architectures and models. Okay, at the neuroscience level, we will talk a little bit about wetware issues. We'll talk a little bit about um, the neuron function structure of neurons neur and, and neurotransmitters. Actually, I, 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 I'm not gonna say that much about them other than to say uh, there is a structure to neurons, you know that. There are different neurotransmitters. I don't think you guys ever talk about that. Do you ever talk about that? 
No. Okay. Well, there are. <laughs> Not in computer science. Okay. Well, you ought to, uh, because they don't do the same things. Okay. Um, we'll talk. Uh, well, I'll mention for for you now. Um, the nervous system has an anatomy, and I really don't see a lot. You know, some of you worry about this. Maybe Christian does. Right? Yeah. So neurotransmitters, he taught me. Okay. And central anatomy, I know. Okay. Okay. These I know. Okay. Like, but but. The central anatomy is, you know, really huge and complex and a specialty all of its own with different areas of the brain responsible for different kinds of things. Um, when you guys use a, this uh, neuron model of, of computation or reasoning, you're really only working at sort of the neuron structure yeah. level you're not paying any attention to brain anatomy it is a one size fits all doesn't matter what the nature of the computation there, is. there are models which can be keep like keep considered the central anatomy also okay yeah well pay attention to those because it's really annoying to cognitive scientists when you assume that everything we need to know about thought is wrapped up in the structure of a neuron. Not true, for sure. Um, we will, I don't think, do we have time? No, we really don't. Um, when we come back, we'll look at uh, Posner, who is, in my view, one of the best cognitive neuroscientists, um, and his view on what we can learn from lesions at the neuroscience level. and. Um, and then we'll make the point finally that um, there's a ideal convergence between the the wetware level and the algorithmic level so that you know the, the best work marries those two which is what they're trying to do in the project mm -hmm. with svetlana and yeah. and uh Rupik. Yes. so okay i think that's all we can do today um dr shannon there was uh, i mean you you can dismiss the class if you want, but there was an idea that I wanted to bounce off of you. Okay. So, I, and um, I'm going to try to be very pedantic here, but um, I don't know a lot. So, cognitive science and neuroscience are um, are different in the way that cognitive science tries to understand the nature of the human mind, whereas neuroscience is the study of the uh, it is the study of the human brain and how it works. So these two fields of subjects are operating at different levels at which we process things. I would say I would say they they overlap, but there's yes. a lot of things that go on in neuroscience that cognitive scientists don't tend to worry about. Um, and you know, in, in sort of that whole that whole field of Things like hormones and behavior, mm -hmm. uh, maturity, day-night responses. There's a whole ton of stuff. Yes, e even even things like for a particular human being, the environment, the way that you sure. have been brought up, or um, the particular day or time in which a particular event is happening, and a lot of it uh, goes on into it. The point that I'm trying to make here is that um, the neural network models on which most of language models are based on are inspired by neuroscience um, in, in the way, uh, as in people, people thought that, okay, in the human brain, neurons are getting fired. And so let us try and build a model. Deepak, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, Just feel free to stop and tell me that Megha, you're wrong here. Um, so yeah, so the neural networks were made keeping, keeping that in mind. But if we want to mimic or complement or stimulate human behavior or the human mind with the, with the aid of a machine, then we need a cognitive model that encompasses all of these other aspects that you just spoke about, the hormone, the behavior, the environment, um, all of these things. Mm -hmm. that, that just a neural network model is incapable of uh, processing well i you know i think you can do miracles with 768 parameters <laughs> especially yeah. 768 parameters that don't have a name um uh, and you can you can make a mathematical model 
that summarizes or that provides a description of some of the regularities that you see. But you haven't the foggiest idea. Do you know Henry Markham? Pardon me? Henry Markham. So he is like a very famous computer neuroscientist. So he introduced an idea in 2009 to reconstruct the whole brain. And that is still not happened. Of course in not. 2023, and in the TED Talk, he mentioned that in the next 10 years, till 2019, we will be able to complete the reconstruction of the human brain. Uh -huh. And that was not done no. till 2023, after being 15 years. He just said 10 years. Yeah. But it's 15 years from that talk. Yeah. And uh, there is a paper, uh, not a paper, but an article which uh, which covers all that things, like how that uh, how that model fails, and they are just able to reconstruct some of the uh, red mind, like not not even a single neuronal level or any kind of in the human brain, but they were able to do on the red mind. Mm -hmm some kind of reconstruction. So it's a hard problem. It's a hard And I'm not problem. complaining, and I had to defend this position this morning during my colloquium. I'm not complaining that there are people who are partitioning the problem, the research problem of understanding cognition using the methods that they're using. I just wanna make sure that you are aware of what the whole picture really looks like and where your methods fit in that whole picture. My personal preference is to work at the computational theory level. What are the important problems that people are solving? What are the inputs that they have to solve those? What are their outputs? That's my contribution. And I view that as a positive thing for the people who want to work at the algorithmic level or the neuroscience level because it focuses your attention, like I said, you're not going to get to those higher level functional descriptions by looking at the lowest level of analysis. You won't get there. It, which is which is exactly why Dr. Shed keeps saying that your language models don't understand, and that is absolutely true. It is not. It is not meant to understand. It is not built to understand. And even, I mean, Dr. Shed should have been here. Uh, for me to, uh, for you know, to hear me say this, even adding uh, external pieces of knowledge in whatever form it, to a neural network model, it is still not going it's to not be able. To, it's not enough. You, not you need a, a separate model altogether to be able to incorporate uh, external knowledge, a, a neural network, and all of that together. Uh, embodiment and you know how your experiences map to the world Bring and all that. In logic also in the picture because we just saw the deductive reasoning and the arithmetic yeah. world problems. All all of that requires a lot more than a just more a language than model or just a knowledge graph and yeah bringing it together just somehow merging it but this is this is why Amit and I have had a 15 year co collaboration we actually are on the same page about these issues so that's why we have this all knowledge infused learning and working on some small small parts starting with the mental health because it is not covering the whole world yeah, I would say, but but I I would say that you know even the reasoning associated with mental health and mental health diagnostics is pretty complicated. It yes, probably it looks a whole lot more like that deductive reasoning example that I gave you than it does a you know a language translation you know machine translation kind of a problem. Yeah, so these guys work on alleviate. So alleviate is something like combining all these things together, lexical, whatever I understand after reading that and attending meetings. So knowledge, then uh, this algorithmic content, mm -hmm. say, and then uh, how you were doing that uh, safe ground checks. What do you call in that paper? So it's uh, medical, uh guidance based uh, safety. yeah so sa safety checks that they are doing in it and then generating some kind of questions whatever i understand so this is just a small problem 
which they are trying to solve here. But what GPT three, what Chat GPT is doing is that it is just training all the data, all the content, all like whatever the knowledge available till twenty twenty one. They just trained it, and it is hallucinating in some way. Uh, it, it it does something. It makes some mistakes. Yeah. Um, but it is tethered to its past experience. Yes. That's something you want to worry about. Um, it doesn't retrain easily. There might be new methods for that, but yes. uh, that's a problem. There are a number of issues that I'm going to try to raise uh, concerning uh, reasoning about change over time, what uh, is retained over time, what inferences get dismissed over time when new assertions are made, all that sort of stuff is not well handled in these large language models. I, I remember that uh, example of Elon Musk marrying uh, Kamala. Kamala Harris. <laughs> so they just like uh, stopped that information to train it. But yeah. what if it is like, like, like that example? It is keep on uh, learning that Right, false information. Right, that will. Right, we will be not able to like uh, rectify it. Right. So just because that, just because something is represented in text at a certain frequency level doesn't mean that that's the frequency level or the importance of that thing in the real world. And that you know, there's a, there's this frequency heuristic inside these large language models that just makes me nuts. <laughs> Um, because it's it's not um, reflective of the world, and it yes. cause you to make mistakes. In mistakes, inferences that you really don't want to be making. Yeah, false information. False information, biased information, biased. all that, all that sort yes. of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that I wanted a view upon for you. Uh, I want your view on it. Let's say we perfected language models. One day, magically learns everything that we are facing problem with right now. So even with that, we want to be, we discovered so many things, let's say some way down in the line, we discovered all the things, but we are uh, losing the intellectual things that we were supposed to find and we give it to a model, which is a black box. <laughs> yeah. We won't completely understand or oh, understand no. the, yes. the anatomy of it, like how does it work? So it's the way I see it, like what are you gaining in terms of application versus what are you losing? So even if we, let's say, developed a perfect model that can do all this, isn't, isn't, is this the thing that we should take? Uh, as a success? To? As a success? Yeah. Marco's going to get really mad at me, so we have to let you go. So clinicians don't support black box yeah. models. Yeah, there's, there's. Uh, issues of personal responsibility, litigation, um, social good, uh, value, judgments on alternative pathways and interpretations. Uh, for example, should you use a medical drug treatment model for dealing with mental health, or should you use a talk therapy model for dealing with mental health problems? These are not just decided by what works best, but also by what is most cost effective and what is most practical to implement. So there's a, even if you had the holy grail model <laughs> of let's just say mental health treatment. Let's just say a simple example of, uh, of predicting autism. Or, uh, or predicting uh, autism. Yeah, predicting yeah. autism. Mm -hmm. It's hundred percent accuracy that uh, not autism. Let's say predicting something that has hundred percent accuracy, but you really don't understand the problem itself. You're right. just you. Well, you're not. I, you know, I just I, I, I just don't accept your premise. Yeah. Um, you're not you're not going to get a perfect model. So and the and and this is back to that frequency argument. Savannah and I talk about this yeah. all the time. It doesn't matter. If you're right 99% of the time, if 1% of the time you kill somebody, you've got you got to get that frequency basis of evaluation 
out of your head. That's not the right way to think about things, in my opinion. So you, you'll still make a mistake, and the mistakes that you could make could be deadly. I think, like, uh, like for example, I, I know about a uh, trolling problem. Like, uh, oh yes. How, how can you find a, a conscious answer for that? Yeah. Like you can never. Right. Right. Make a. You can never justify your choice. Choices yeah. you can never. Justify. We are, we actually have some work in the lab going on about that about that problem. But okay, Marco's going to kill me. Okay, go. Uh, and then somebody needs to shut this down and stop the recording. Oh, yeah. And to be continued. And oh my God, I have no idea how far I'm going to get in you know, the next class. But you know, I sort of set this up so that the really big important stuff would come out at the very beginning. And the rest is just so. Stop the Thanks, Vanna. Bye.